please raise your hand if the system or site you work on gets deployed to production at least once a week. Okay, um, keep your hand up if it's deployed at least once a day. Three times a day? 10 times a day? 20 times a day? Well, at Instagram, we deploy our backend code around 40 times a day. Every time an engineer commits code to master, it is automatically tested and deployed to the entire fleet in as little as 10 minutes with no human interaction in most cases for every commit. My name is Michael Gorvin. I'm a production engineer at Facebook. And today, I'm going to tell you how Instagram does continuous deployment at scale. Brief outline of my talk. Why do we even do continuous deployment? What is the point? How did we go about implementing this system? What problems did we face with it that we needed to address? What are the key principles which enable this to work? And these are the things which you can go off and apply in your own companies to do something similar. And finally, what's left to do? Quick bit of nomenclature before we get started. So the term diff refers to a pull request, essentially. It is a proposed change that is currently in code review. The term land refers to committing a change to master. A commit is a diff which has been landed, i.e. it refers to the commit that is now in the master branch. And a rollout is a deployment to production. I use the term rollout and deploy interchangeably. So the flow is that the engineer puts up a diff, it gets accepted, he lands the diff, that results in a commit and master, and that then gets deployed. So why do we do continuous deployment? What are the benefits which make it worth the time and effort to implement and maintain the system? There are a couple advantages. The first is that it allows our engineers to move fast, really fast. When our engineers aren't beholden to a fixed push schedule, they can get their changes out whenever they want to. Within reason, we do discourage landing outside of normal business hours simply for the sake of the on-calls. But other than that, engineers can choose when they want to get their code out. This means that they don't waste time waiting for the next push to happen, time which they probably aren't going to use very effectively and which Kent Beck theorizes is inevitably filled with meetings. This also means they can iterate multiple times a day. Sometimes you're working on a problem where you need to get your code into production before you can decide what to do next. Maybe you're debugging a complex problem and you need to keep collecting different bits of data as you follow the trail, or you're just squashing bugs which only appear once your code is actually live. With continuous deployment, engineers can do this as many times a day as they want to. They aren't limited to a fixed number of pushes a day. Secondly, it makes it much easier to identify bad commits. When you're deploying tens or hundreds of commits in one go and something breaks, that's a big haystack you need to look through to figure out what the bad commit is. With continuous deployment, your haystack is much smaller. And in our case, most of the time, there is no hay because we're deploying one commit at a time, and so it's obvious what the problematic one is. This is also really useful for tracking down problems which are identified at a later stage. Sometimes we'll get a report that some functionality is broken. We'll then dig in and find some metric or data which indicates this brokenness. From that metric, we can identify when this actually started, and we then look at the rollouts that occurred around that time, and we know exactly the handful of diffs that went out. And thirdly, we're not left in an undeployable mess. When you've got a whole bunch of changes waiting to go out and master and something is broken, Nothing gets out until you figure out what the broken change is and back it out, which can get messy with merge conflicts. And so broken changes end up delaying other changes. With continuous deployment, we don't get into this situation. And it means that we can always get important changes out. We aren't ever stuck because we are in an undeployable state. So how did we go about implementing this? Now, the thing I'd like you to notice about this implementation is the iterative approach which was taken. This wasn't something that was built off on the side, and then one day we suddenly switched over to doing continuous deployment. Rather, this was a continual evolution of our existing mechanisms until it became continuous deployment. It was very intentional, but it was an evolution of the existing mechanisms. So how did things work before? Well, engineers deployed changes when they wanted to. They'd land their change. If they wanted it out now, they'd manually run a deployment. Otherwise, they'd just wait for someone else to come along and do it at a later stage. 
This was all implemented as a Fabric script. For those who don't know, Fabric is a Python library and tool for basically SSHing to servers. And so this implemented the process of creating a package, distributing to all the web servers, and orchestrating the restart of the web servers. Engineers were expected to know how to do a small-scale test. So they would actually run two rollouts. The first would target a single machine. Once that was done, they'd then log into the machine, have a look at the logs, sit, check that everything looks fine, and then they'd run a second deployment, now targeting the entire fleet. And we had a basic database and web UI on top of it called Sauron, which basically recorded a log of the rollouts. So simply who had done it, what time they did it, and the, the revision that they were deploying. Now, Sauron also holds what we call our operational locks. These are how we coordinate access to various parts of our infrastructure. If you're working on something which can't be interrupted, you would take the appropriate lock here, and that is how you communicate to others that you are busy working on this part. The engineer doing a deployment needed to take the right lock here, and that is how we ensured that we didn't have multiple people deploying at the same time. So the first thing that we did is we added a canary. Now, at first, this was simply scripting what the engineer was already expected to do. So instead of running two rollouts, one targeting a single machine and then the entire fleet, they'd run a single rollout. It would ask, do you want to test on this machine? You'd say yes. It would deploy to that machine, tail the logs for you. When you were happy, you'd stop the tail and would ask you, do you want to continue to the rest of the fleet? This wasn't making any decisions at this stage. It was simply automating what people were already expected to do. The next step was to actually have a look at this, the success of the canary. So we collected the HTTP status codes of every, of every request that was served. Our Django application sent these status codes on our local socket. A script picked those up and tallied them, and then applied a set of simple percentage-based thresholds. So there must be at less than 0.5% 5xx responses, at least 90% 2xx responses. And if that wasn't the case, it would simply warn you that these thresholds weren't met. It wouldn't stop you from deploying. Now, we already had a test suite, but it was only run by engineers on their development machines. So when someone put up a diff, you had to take their word for it that they'd run the test suite and everything was passing. And we didn't necessarily know that every revision we were deploying actually had a clean test run. So we got Jenkins to run tests on master commits. Jenkins is a continuous integration system, and we had to just watch the master branch as commits came in. It would test those commits and then report this to Sauron. At this stage, Sauron only kept track of the latest commit, which had passed tests. So when doing a rollout, instead of it suggesting that you deploy the very latest commit, it would suggest that you deploy the latest commit, which had passed tests. And then we add test runs on diffs. Facebook has a continuous integration system called Sandcastle. So whenever you created or updated a diff, it would automatically run tests and report those test status on the diff itself so everyone could see them. Then we added some groundwork for the automation. So the first were adding states to the rollout. So far, it was simply a log of what had happened. This added states, so it would initially be in running state while it was in progress. If it was successful, it would go into done state, or if it failed, it would go to error state. This meant that we actually knew what the result of the previous rollout was. Then we added full commit tracking. So far, we only knew the latest commit, which had passed tests. Instead, we had a post commit hook upload metadata for every commit to Sauron, and Jenkins then reported the test run status against each specific commit. So we now knew all the commits in master that were waiting to go out and the test run status for each of them. And then we added the abort button. So when a rollout was running, an abort button would appear in the UI. If you hit that button, it would change the status to aborted, and the rollout script occasionally checked the status in the database and would abort if it noticed this change. So the main part of the Sauron UI is this table. And this table contains two types of entries, commits and rollouts. So commits are essentially what you would see if you ran git log on the master branch, it's simply a reverse chronological listing of commits. We have the commit hash, which links to the web-based um, repo viewer, the author of the commit, which links to their online profile so you can easily get their contact information, the test run status as determined by Jenkins, the description, and the time that it was committed. Then rollouts are slotted into this table directly above the commit which they are deploying. So there are the rollouts. They're identified by an integer number. We have the user doing the rollout, which currently is Jenkins. I'll get to that. 
the commit information is exactly the same as the commit below it, because that's the commit which it is deploying. The state column is the rollout state, so these are all done, i.e. they were successful. Targets is the number of machines that the rollout was attempting to deploy to. We don't actually have 999 machines, that's just an example. The deployed column is the number of machines currently running this rollout. So we can see that the entire fleet is currently running this latest rollout here. And then we have the times of the start and end times of the rollout. Now the useful thing of interleaving these two things in a single table is that it makes it easy to tell which new commits a rollout introduced into the fleet. So we can see that this top commit has not been deployed at all yet because there is no rollout above it. This commit introduced one, this rollout introduced one new commit, this rollout introduced two new commits, and this rollout introduced one new commit. Now the really cool thing about this table is that the information in it is automatically updated every second. So you can see exactly what state the system is currently in. So I'll run you through what it looks like when a new commit gets landed. So right now, the very last rollout was successful, and there's nothing new waiting to go out. Someone then lands a commit, and so the commit pops up at the top, and we see it's in testing state, so we know that Jenkins is currently running tests on it. When the tests pass, we'll see the test state change to passed, and then the actual rollout starts. So it pops up at the top, we see that Jenkins is doing the rollout, it's currently in running state, we're targeting the entire fleet. Then we see the deploy counts go to one, this is when it gets deployed to the canary. So we know that it's now currently testing this on the canary machine. Once all those thresholds passes, the real fun starts, and we deploy to the rest of the fleet. And we can see the machines as they get updated to the new rollout, the count of the previous rollout goes down, and when it's all done, the rollout will go into done state, and we're ready for the next commit. Then we needed to automate some decisions, which were currently still made by humans. So the first was the commit selection. If there are multiple commits in master, which one do you choose to deploy? The logic we implemented initially was very simple. Always pick a commit which had passed tests, pick as few commits as possible, and never more than three. So if the next commit in the branch had a clean test run, it would deploy one commit at a time. If the next commit had failed tests, the one after that had passed tests, we'll deploy two commits. We'd do up to three, but if we had more than three, without clean test runs, we wouldn't automatically select a commit. Then we had to fail the rollout of more than 1% of host fail. So far, only an exception in the rollout script itself would cause the rollout to fail. Now we actually looked at how many machines actually got successfully deployed to. And finally, we had to warn if the previous rollout failed. So when you started the rollout, it would go check the status of the previous rollout. If that was not done, i.e. successful, it would warn you so that you would know that things were not in a normal state. Now at this stage, a rollout was simply answering yes a couple times. You'd run the script, it would say, this is the suggested commit to deploy, it'd say yes. Do you want to test on the canary? Yes. If the thresholds were passed, it would say, do you want to deploy to the rest of the fleet? It'd say yes, and we'd go off and do its thing. So, we made the yes automatic. All those answers which would normally be answered yes when everything was in a known good state could be answered automatically without a human. We then got Jenkins to run this. So instead of someone running this on their development machine, Jenkins would run the rollout script. And this gave us a UI to access the logs of the rollout, including live updates as it was running. And the engineer implementing this initially supervised Jenkins, i.e. he would only enable Jenkins to run the rollout while he was at his desk and looking at it, until one day he didn't need to anymore. And we were doing continuous deployment. However, things were not completely smooth from the get-go. The first problem is that Sauron looked like this often. Someone would land a change which broke the tests. All the subsequent changes which got landed now also had that bad change in them. We'd have all these failed test runs, and the automation wouldn't be able to do anything. Or it looked like this. Those blank boxes are where Jenkins hasn't even started testing the commit, and this one is still in testing state over a year later. I don't think it's gonna get done. <laughs> so when we got into the state, someone had to notice that we were in the state, identify and revert the bad commit, wait for the test to pass on the revert, and now, because we had more than three commits with failed test runs, manually run a deployment of the revert before the automation could pick up again. That person was often myself, and I gained quite a reputation for being the reverter of diffs, 
and led to my former manager creating this to post to Twitter as part of a discussion about our continuous deployment system. So what did we do? Well, firstly, we made the tests faster. They were taking 12 to 15 minutes to run at this stage, and an engineer could easily put up a diff, get it accepted, and land it before the test had even finished running. We got the test to run in about five minutes. There were a couple of optimizations here, uh, putting databases in memory, increasing parallelism, profiling and optimizing Python code that was heavily used, and we got them running in about five minutes. Then we also had to make them more reliable. Sometimes they would just fail completely, usually, usually with database-related issues. This was simply a case of identifying the common breakages, fixing them, and plastering over a little bit with retries. And then we also added this land lock. Now, the problem when we got into this state is that changes would keep, keep getting landed, and we kind of build up this backlog that we would then be forced to roll out in one big rollout, which defeats one of the goals of continuous deployment. So we added this land lock that we could acquire when we noticed we were in this state, and this would throw up a big warning when engineers tried to land changes. This allowed us to keep new changes out of master until we sorted out this situation and things were functioning normally again. So everything was going to be awesome now, right? Not quite. It still looked like this six months later. What was going on here? Well, engineers didn't wait for the test to run. What would often happen here is that they'd have their diff accepted. They would then make a minor change to the diff, update it, land it, but that minor change broke the test. Or they didn't rebase. They created their branch a week ago, and things were all fine on that week old code, but as soon as all the newer code got integrated when they merged, suddenly there'd been some kind of interaction which broke the test. Or there was some kind of external breakage. We do have some integration tests which talk to remote services, and when those have problems, our tests can fail. And while this isn't the fault of the diff author, it still puts us in the state where we don't have clean test runs to enable deployment. So the solution to this was to run tests during landing. So as part of Sandcastle's functionality, there's something called Landcastle, where instead of locally doing a git merge and git push of your change to master, you instead create this Landcastle job containing a git bundle or equivalent of your change. This Landcastle job would then asynchronously create a branch with your change, rebase it, and push it to the server on your behalf. Now, this meant that we could get Landcastle to run the entire test suite before it did the push step. And if any of the tests failed, it would fail the land, and the change would not get into master. So this meant that we were enforcing a clean test run on freshly rebased code before anything got into master. And this pretty much eradicated test failures in master. So the tests catch a lot of problems during development. The canary catches some really bad stuff before it gets out to the fleet. But we do occasionally still deploy broken code. And that's OK. We aren't a telecommunications provider. We're not promising a 6.9's SLA. It's OK if things break from time to time. Now, that doesn't say that we don't care about reliability. We do take it very seriously and have a very high bar. We just take an approach of break it fast and fix it fast. And even with traditional lengthy release processes, you still end up deploying bad code. And when that happens, it takes you even longer to mitigate that because of the lengthy release process. So we needed good monitoring and alarming, because we want to know about this as fast as possible. We had pretty good monitoring already, but we needed some works to get our alarms to fire faster while still being high signal. Now, when we realized we were in this state, what would happen is we'd run a deployment of an older commit, which would create a new package, distribute it to all the machines, and finally restart the fleet, and sometimes canary it as well, depending on what you chose. So this would take as long as a regular deployment. To improve this, we implemented a fast rollback mechanism. Instead, this would simply switch each web server to the old package which was still present on the local disk, which enabled us to skip the, prep, the package distribution and the canarying step. And this enabled us to roll back a bad rollout in two to three minutes instead of double that time. So with the monitoring and the rollback, we can typically respond to a bad rollout in less than 10 minutes, sometimes less than five. Now, we do sometimes get backlogs of commits waiting to go out. We have false positives on the canary or something else that, that brings the deployment to a halt, and someone needs to get things going again. Once that's working again, 
the commit selection would select one commit at a time. And so it would take a while to get through this backlog. This also meant that new changes being landed had a lengthy delay before they got out. So what usually happened here is the on-call would step in and they'd deploy the entire backlog in one go in order to get things operating normally again. But again, deploying that entire backlog in one go defeats one of the goals of continuous deployment. So we implemented automatic batching. This enabled the commit selection logic to deploy more commits per rollout when there was a backlog. So the way this algorithm worked is we set a time goal to get each commit out in 30 minutes. So we look at the commits waiting in the master branch, see how much time we have left until that goal expires. We then look at, calculate how many rollouts we can do in that time, simply using a hard-coded value of five minutes per rollout. And we then calculate how many commits we'd have to deploy per rollout in order to meet the goal for that commit. So for the first commit, we have one rollout left. We only have one commit to do, so that's one. Commit two, we still only have one rollout left. We have to get two commits out, so we'd have to do two commits per rollout. For the third commit, we have two rollouts left, three commits, so 1.5. For the fourth commit, we have two rollouts left. We have four commits to go, so we'd have to do two commits per rollout. And for commit five, we still have lots of time, and so one commit per rollout will get us there. We then take the maximum of these, because we want to meet the goal for every commit, but we still cap this at three to keep things reasonable. Now, the advantage of this algorithm is that it takes the changing backlog into account. As new commits get landed, those get taken into account and it adapts. So it, does, it does, gets every commit out in a reasonable time while still doing as many rollouts as possible and as few commits per rollout as possible. The other problem is that our deploy got slower as our infrastructure grew. Initially, the bottleneck was the proportion of the fleet that we can afford to take down to restart at one time, roughly 15%. But as we added more and more web servers, that stopped being the bottleneck. The first was the SSH agent. It was pegging an entire CPU core, simply authenticating all the SSH connections to the web servers. And the other was FAB itself. Even though it uses multiprocessing, there's still a single master process that coordinates all these operations, and that master process was pegging an entire core. And this meant that deploys were taking around 10 minutes instead of five or six. The solution here was to implement to a distributed SSH mechanism, which Facebook already has internally, called Hypershell. And this got us back to restarting 15% of the fleet at once and doing rollouts in five or six minutes. So what are the key principles which enable the system to work? And these are the things that you can use to apply to similar systems in your companies. So the first is the test suite. Now, they need to be fast. I found that five minutes is about this threshold. Less than that time, you don't really notice it, the time it takes for tests to run. By the time you've checked your email, caught up on Facebook, the tests are done and things can progress. But at longer than five minutes, it becomes obvious that the tests are still running, and it slows things down in the master branch in terms of getting t clean test runs for deployment to start. You need decent coverage. Your test needs to be good enough to catch serious problems during development, but it doesn't have to be perfect. We certainly don't have a perfect test coverage. It just needs to be good enough to catch the really bad stuff. And you need to run your tests often. You need to run them during code review, you need to run them before landing changes, and preferably such that it blocks the land, as well as after landing, because you want to be sure that every revision you deploy has a clean test run. Then you need an automated canary. You need a way to test a change with a small amount of production traffic before deploying to the entire fleet. And the purpose is to catch the really bad commits, the things that are going to take that cause tens of percents of requests to fail to your site. But it doesn't have to catch everything. It's OK if occasionally some bad changes get out. So start with something simple. Instagram is still using these percentage-based thresholds on overall HTTP status codes. It's good enough for us. It's probably good enough for you, too. Have the automation handle things when on that are in the normal good case. If thing is, anything is not normal, just have it stop and let humans step in. The automation doesn't need to handle every single possible situation. Just have it handle things where you know things are in a good state. Fourthly, make people comfortable. I think a big barrier to automation like this is that people feel that they're giving up control. They're not gonna know what the automation is doing. The automation is gonna run amok and do crazy stuff. 
and so it's important to make people feel comfortable with this. So you do that with having simple, understandable behavior. It should never be a surprise what the automation decides to do. And this also links back to the previous point of only handling the normal case, when things are known good. You need good visibility. It needs to be easy to see what the automation has done, what it is currently doing, and preferably what it is about to do. This is what the store on UI accomplishes for us with the live updates. And you need stop mechanisms. You need ways for humans to be able to step in, say, hang on, something's not right, stop what you're doing. We have that abort button in the Sauron UI. If you take the operational lock, the rollouts won't start. And you can also disable the Jenkins jobs directly. And you need good detection and rollback. Bad commits are going to get out, and that's OK. You just need to detect that and react to that as quickly as possible. So have good monitoring and alarming around that and the fast way to roll back those changes. So this is working pretty well for us, but there are some challenges and improvements which we are looking at. The first is keeping up with the commit rate. Instagram is growing quickly, we're adding more and more engineers, and they're gonna be landing more and more changes. We still want to be able to deploy one commit in most cases, and so we need the rollout to be fast enough to accommodate this. One option we're looking at here is some kind of pipelining. So split the deploy up into two stages. The first stage canaries the change and distributes the package to all the web servers, and the second change does the actual restart of all the web servers. And these two parts take roughly the same amount of time currently. We could then have the second stage of rollout one run concurrently with the first stage of rollout two. So by the time we finish the restart of the web servers for rollout one, we can immediately launch into the restart of, of the entire fleet for rollout two, because it's already canaried and distributed the package. So we currently test on a single machine and then deploy to the entire fleet. But there's a limit to how small, small an error rate we can detect on a single machine just because of the signal to noise ratio. So we're looking at adding multiple stages before we get to the entire fleet. So after we've tested on one machine, we could deploy to an entire cluster, wait a little while, check some metrics, deploy to an entire region, check some metrics, and then deploy to the entire fleet. Now the challenge here is going to be doing this fast enough so it doesn't slow down the rollout process. And so this would almost certainly require the pipelining I mentioned previously. Then we want to try and improve the canary's detection capabilities. There are two types of ca cases that it doesn't handle very well. The first are failures on a relatively small volume endpoints. Even if you break certain functionality, if it's relatively small compared to the rest of the functionality, we won't be able to detect that because of the, the, the noisiness of a single machine in, over, in aggregate. So we're looking at adding per view function stats and thresholds. So essentially collect these stats for each type of request we handle and apply these thresholds for every type instead of in global. Now the second problem we have are changes in behavior and interactions with backend services. Let's say that a diff doubles the number of database calls that get done. When the, the Canary machine is doing double the number of database calls, that's not a problem. But when the entire fleet is doing double the number of database calls, the database falls over. So we're looking at collecting stats on the number of calls we make to remote services and check that those don't change too much on the Canary. Now the problem with these static thresholds is that they have to be relatively generous. The error rate does fluctuate during the day, does vary from cluster to cluster, and can also be influenced by spammers doing weird stuff. What we're looking at instead is to collect the same set of stats from a set of control machines in the same cluster as the canary, and rather look at the difference between the canary and the control in order to detect these changes. This would hopefully allow us to catch smaller problems while still keeping the false positive rate to a reasonable level. Most cases of the deploy coming to, uh, coming to a halt are due to the canary failures, which still requires someone to step in, triage that, revert the diff if necessary, and get things moving again. So we're looking at adding a canary step during the land castle job. So after it's run the test suite and everything passed, it would then canary that diff on its production machine, test the same thresholds, and then if those don't, don't pass, fail the land. Now, this wouldn't replace the canary during the actual rollout because we still want to test every package that we're deploying. But it would keep bad commits out of master and stop them from bringing deployment to a halt. 
So what should you take away from this talk? The main thing I'd like you to take away is that you can do this too. Continuous deployment systems don't need to be complex, and they aren't only within reach of big companies like Instagram. Start with something simple, try to evolve your current mechanisms, and stick to these principles. A fast test suite with decent, but not necessarily perfect coverage, which are run often, during code review, before landing, after landing. A simple automated canary to test changes in production before deploying to the entire fleet. Make people comfortable. Have simple, understandable behavior, good visibility so you know what's going on, and stop mechanisms for people to be able to step in. And have good detection and fast rollback. Good monitoring and alarming, and fast rollback mechanisms. In case you're wondering, this is the command which deploys Instagram server. Thank you. Are there any questions? Hi, uh, fantastic talk. Um, I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about how you separate uh, the actual activation of a new feature for all users ever from the fact that the code is out there in production. Yeah, so we do have extensive um, runtime configuration, various mechanisms for um, partial behavior and runtime configuration, so we do extensively use that. Um, so code going out onto the fleet doesn't necessarily mean it's active right away. But um, that requires people to actually think ahead of what might be a problem, which doesn't happen in all cases. And so that doesn't gate necessarily everything. Um, uh, how do you handle uh, connection draining when you're restarting services during a deploy? Connection draining. Um, so what happens is that we touch a file in the local file system. The health check endpoint in the Django application looks at that file. If it notices that there, then starts failing the health check. That then takes out the load balancer, and we then do the restart. What's your approach to database schema changes? <laughs> that, <laughs> that's pretty complex. Come chat to me later. I can discuss that. Hi, um, so thanks for the talk. Um, I think we're also trying to implement CD at the moment. Um, I wanted to ask, um, did your developers like have a test suite and have they been writing tests from the get-go? Because at the moment we have an issue where we, I think we don't, we don't have a culture of, of wanting to write tests. And like how do I, how do we overcome that? Yeah. <laughs> We, we did have a test suite at the get-go, so that did give us a good starting point. Um, but test coverage and a culture of writing tests is something we're currently working on. Some developers take it seriously, others don't. Um, and so that's why the canary is important, because the test suite is not sufficient to tell whether it's a good change or not. But we did start off from a point where we did have a reasonable test suite. So you guys don't do reviews on pull requests? Um, you you um, trust that the developer actually wrote the test? Um, and merge that code into, or well, test that code. Yeah, a, a, lo a lot of code is already tested or add new tests, but not everything. Okay, cool, thanks. Uh, a question here is, um, do we have just one repository with all the code that we're deploying, or are there multiple repositories? Or? This is all in a single repository. So this is basically one Django application. Um, so it seems you guys implemented this sort of mid-flight. You had CI with manual releases. We're at the start, so we've got four developers. Um, would you, in retrospect, start using CD from the start, if you, if you could? Is that, is that better than switching at mid-flight, you think? It depends, like, what is the benefits, and is it worth the effort for you? Um, I think getting 
the test infrastructure in place would be a very useful thing from the start and automating the actual rollout process, even if it is still triggerly, manually triggered at this stage. And that kind of gets you to the point where it's relatively easy to then move to autom automatically triggering the rollout process. Um, do you have automation specialists um, writing your automation, or do you write it, do the developers write their own automation suites? So I'm not quite following what you're asking about. Do you have automation engineers, or do you developers um, th write the test suites? Oh, we don't have a specific test engineers that do testing. They're done by developers okay. along with the main changes. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, what level of unit tests do you do? Uh, it's just functional integration tests, or is it the pure mock, pure unit tests that just use mocks? It's a mix. Um, a lot of it is mocked, but there are a fair amount of integration tests. Um, the integration tests tend to be more flaky, especially if they're talking to remote services, but at the same time, they cover things which the unit tests don't cover. So we don't have a great solution for how we deal with those, um, and that's something that we probably are going to need to address. Um, maybe some way of separating the integration tests, or at least telling is this an actual test failure versus some part that we're integrating with. Um, yeah. Um, you mentioned earlier using configuration. Using configuration for runtime uh, feature changes. What is your actual mechanism for distributed configuration management? Uh, basically, Zookeeper. So there are multiple mechanisms. There's something called knobs, which is basically just an integer. Um, configuration, and in the code you decide how you use that integer. It could be a random percentage-based threshold, it could be hashed by user ID, it could be hashed by machine ID, um, and then we have a more complex gating system called GateLogic. There's actually a blog post on the Instagram engineering blog about GateLogic specifically, um, which enables more powerful gating mechanisms. Hi, Michael. You mentioned that uh, you guys fail rollovers if you don't make about 1% of, uh, of successful deployments. Uh, do you guys have any way of tracking which servers have failed? Is it the developer's responsibility to pick that up? Or? Yeah, so part of Soron's functionality, and actually one of the very initial um, reasons for Soron was to track what rollout a machine is running. So as part of the rollout process, it actually reports into Soron that I've restarted with this version, and Soron then can build a list of hosts which are running outdated versions. Um, this might be a bit of a strange question, but has your engineers um, become dependent on the rollouts to see the effect of their backend code, or do they still kind of use a local method for testing, uh, and do you have a test environment? I suspect they have become a bit reliant, because this generally works pretty well, and so it's pretty easy to get your changes out. Um, they probably would have to test a lot better if they're running on a lengthier deployment process, so probably yes. For your pipeline, are you considering running multiple canary operations in parallel? Um, so as part of the canary during landing step, that will essentially happen because we could have multiple changes landing at the same time. Um, in terms of the actual rollout step, it's, it's probably not a major benefit because it, distributing the package and orchestrating the restart take most of the time. And actually, the canarying is done in parallel with distributing the package, so it wouldn't actually benefit us to run canaries beforehand of future commits going out. There's an interesting question from Cloud Africa on Twitter, actually. Um, what's the cost of having 15% of your fleet out of use at all times while receiving a deploy? Because that's once every 12 minutes uh, if you're doing 40 times a day every eight hours. So when we provision our capacity, we need to take into account spikes in usage as well as growth. So we usually have a fair amount of headroom uh, that we do use for rollouts. Um, when we are in a situation where we've got less capacity available, um, if we're testing, um, draining a, a region, for example, to test our capacity limit, we do sometimes need to reduce that percentage, which makes deploys go slower, um, which does slow things down. But as a case of we have the capacity most of the time, and so it's okay to do it 15%. Um, do you implement any security tests as part of your deployment pipeline? Security relates to what? Uh, maybe there's some testing you need to perform on the code, or code review. Um, security is kind of done beforehand during development and um, code review, yeah. 
Um, if, if you do this kind of thing on front-end code, is there any different difference there, JavaScript and HTML? Probably the main challenge there would be testing the canary effectively. How do you actually tell that your front-end code is working? Um, if you have some kind of JavaScript reporting from the client to tell you that things are actually successfully loading, then you could use that as your canary signal. But practically, the concepts would be the same, I think. Hi. Um, how do you ensure your tests are of a high quality? Like, that they're not just writing tests for the sake of saying they've done 10 tests. Are there any guidelines or...? We haven't formalized the process for that. Um, one thing we have done recently is get code coverage reports as part of the code review process. So when you put up a diff, you actually get code coverage of the things you're changing, um, which enables reviewers to see what parts of those changes are covered or not. But we don't have a formal process for writing tests. So you're just relying on the developer to know what could potentially fail. And the reviewer. Uh, and the reviewer. Yeah. So I've got, a, I've got a question about your processes. Um, how do you coordinate large projects and large, like large, uh, huge functional releases? So uh, do you guys release little bits of that functionality as you go, or do you have a huge chunk that gets integrated uh, when it's ready to go in? Yeah, we generally try to do it in small bits. We try to discourage very big changes, and it, at the end of the day, it's up to the developer to do it right, because they do land a big change and it fails. We just reverse it and then they need to go back and figure out how to get that right. So it's, they're kind of incentivized to do it in smaller bits because it's less likely they're gonna get everything reverted and they need to work from it again. Any more questions? Uh, how do you manage uh, the growing number of tests that obviously over time will slow down the testing process? Yeah, um, basically parallelism. Um, we've an optimizing database. So every, all the databases are in RAM. So Postgres, Cassandra, everything stores things in RAM. And we've increased the parallelism as much as we can. Um, and then we, I do occasionally profile the test code, see if there's hot Python code that can be optimized. But it does something that needs to be kept an eye on. And we've had cases where tests suddenly take twice as long. And I have to go and debug and figure out why they're suddenly taking longer. So it does something that needs to be continually monitored. Um, when rolling back changes, what do you do about more persistent state, like database changes that might be bad that your rollout doesn't like? Um, so generally, the code change itself doesn't change persistence. Those are things that we do need to um, gradually roll out, so we use these feature flags to actually control that. So most of the time, the code change itself doesn't do much, and then we'll be later using the feature flag mechanisms do the data changes.